All right, the clock has started, so our half hour is beginning, so uh, grab your cookies and your coffee and sit down. We're going to try and pull you out of the afternoon drowsies with a fun half hour chatting about hackers in fiction. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited about this today. I am Kevin Bankston. I'm the director of the Open Technology Institute at New America, where we work to ensure every community has access to an internet that's open and secure. I am also, unlike Betsy Cooper from earlier, an unrepentant and huge science fiction nerd. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with the gentleman to my left. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague from New America, Peter Singer, who is a noted author of, well, he wrote the book on drones and warfare, Wired for War. He wrote the book on cybersecurity with uh, Alan Friedman. Uh, and most recently, he wrote a book of fiction, uh, Ghost Fleet, the most heavily footnoted tech thriller I've ever seen. Um, and we're also very excited to have Walter Parks here. Uh, Walter is a producer and screenwriter, uh, produced far too many movies that you've seen to mention, including Gladiator and the Men in Black movies. He, along with his wife, Lori, uh, ran DreamWorks Studio and now have their own shingle as uh, Parks McDonald Imagination. But uh, for the purposes of today, it's most relevant, he is the co-screenwriter of Hacker Classics, War Games, and Sneakers. Um, yes, uh, applause would be appropriate. <laughs> <coughs> and so to start things off, that we're gonna- That never happens. Yes. <laughs> to start things off, we are going to play one clip from Sneakers and then get right into the conversation. So, cue the clip. Sup, sound? Better with sound. You will give me the box right now, or I will kill you right now. No. Jesus. Just give me the box, Marty. I thought you couldn't kill your friend, Cos. I missed on purpose. Now give me the box. Take the goddamn thing. I don't want it. You win, I lose. That's what you want, isn't it? Say it. Say it. Yes! I'm sorry, cuz. You could have shared this with me. I know. You could have had the power. I don't want it. Don't you know the places we can go with this? Yeah, I do. There's nobody there. Exactly. The world isn't run by weapons anymore, or energy, or money. It's run by little ones and zeros, little bits of data. It's all just electrons. I don't care. I don't expect other people to understand this, but I do expect you to understand this. We started this journey together. It wasn't a journey, Cos. It was a prank. There's a war out there, old friend. A world war. And it's not about who's got the most bullets. It's about who controls the information. What we see and hear, how we work, what we think. It's all about the information. <laughs> so uh, that's 1992, very prescient. Information warfare, the value of data. The box they are fighting over is a wonderful magical MacGuffin that can decrypt anything, so evocative of today's crypto debate. Um, Walter, between these movies and another uh, key film that you, you produced, Minority Report, you've been very prescient. You've, you've talked about uh, automated warfare with the Whopper in war games. You've talked about encryption. You've talked about the role of NSA. And perhaps more than any one individual, you're responsible for the hacker archetype in film. Uh, thanks to War Games and Sneakers, uh, for better and for ill. Uh, and I'm curious, why? What, what, what drew you to write about that subject? Why do you think we are drawn to that type of character as a hero or anti-hero or villain? Or, or all of the above, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, going back to, to uh, War Games, I, I think that we sort of discovered David Lightman more than created him. Um, I was talking to Peter earlier, War Games started as an idea that had nothing to do with technology. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the concept of a brilliant kid born into a world that couldn't really recognize his brilliance and what would he do with his time, and a dying super genius who sort of needed someone to hand his, his legacy down to. 
And so at that time, we were working on the movie, we just started looking into what smart kids like that might be doing. It was sort of the beginning of, of, of home computing. And um, actually met a young man named David Lewis, who was our uh, guide through all of that. Um, actually, our, our David Lightman on the page was probably a little bit less accessible than as interpreted by uh, Matthew Broderick. But it, 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 I think it, it came out of two truths, or at least one truth and something that was true for me and my writing partner, Larry Lasker, who's you know, equally part of those first two uh, projects. Uh, one is that um, the idea of the power that one feels as a young person of being able to exert your will to travel, to invade worlds at a distance is an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a technology that was available to us to depict what we thought was a more universal human emotional uh, uh, drive. On the other hand, and this might have been a mistake, I'm, I'm a person <coughs> of the 60s, I mean, and I, I, so there's a sort of a Robin Hood, anti-authoritarian, who owns information, kind of proto-hacker mentality to that, which is probably we were sort of naive about. Uh, I, 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 there have been times when I've thought that, did we not do a good thing in terms of the way we depicted that first hacker? And I'm, I must say, I've been very happy in talking to a lot of you both in this meeting and others, to see that, well, at least on the other side of the fence, the ideas that were put forth in those movies helped uh, uh, motivate some, some people in this room to get into business, so that's uh, a good sign. Indeed, and, and sneakers as well. I hear, that Peter, with your cybersecurity podcast, you poll people at the end of each of each podcast. What, what, is, what have you found mm -hmm. in polling people? So for the podcast, we've uh, interviewed you know everything from army generals to CEOs to straight up hackers and we ask them at the end of it a uh, simple fun question you know what is your favorite depiction of cybersecurity and fiction and we define you know favorite in any way you want to interpret it and roughly about 60 percent have said sneakers again whether they are a ceo whether they're coming from academia coming from the military so you struck a chord in some way shape or form and as a plug, we're actually, we, ha we just taped a podcast interview with him, which is going to be a big treat for the audience that's been hearing about him for the last year. So we're pretty excited by that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's funny about sneakers. In the podcast, we talked about it. it. It was an object lesson for me about storytelling early on. Because as I said, War Games sort of started not in technology, but started with a relationship to characters. And the technology was there as a means to uh, depict those issues. While we were researching war games, we went to a, a computer security conference and heard about sneakers, uh, defined then as the black hatters, tiger teams, people who were hired by either governments or by, by corporations to test security by actually trying to infiltrate. About three weeks later, the head of the studio was saying, so guys, what are you doing? What's next? And he said, well, we've heard about these things called sneakers. It's sort of like a high-tech dirty dozen. In the room, they say, it's a deal. We want to make that movie. It took us seven years to figure out a story. Uh -huh. I'm not kidding, because it started with the technology. It sort of started with the window dressing, mm -hmm. but we didn't have the kind of infrastructure, the emotional infrastructure, to put it on its feet. So that silly little movie is probably why I'm kind of gray here. Well, so you mentioned the research for war games. Um, you know, verisimilitude is important when it comes to computers. Uh, I look at examples like, say, the movie Black Hat that just came out, which has the most handsome man on the planet, Chris Hemsworth, playing a hacker. I've never seen anyone who looks like that wandering the halls at DEF CON or Black Hat. Mm -hmm. But um, <coughs> that's because I wasn't there this year. Yeah, yeah. So Minority Report is probably the second most often cited piece of fiction in policy discourse around privacy and surveillance. Who can guess the first? 1984, of course. Um, can you tell us about the research process for that? Because I find it very interesting that you put a lot of a lot of knowledge and information in Minority Report, and we really needed that Spielberg cruise vehicle to actually get it to policymakers. I, I, I is that the truth with that one too? Well, it's great to hear. Um, listen, there, there there's been a group and uh, and a person who's been helpful in all of these things. It's a man, some of you may uh, uh, know, named Peter Schwartz 
who uh, was a futurist and was part of something called GBN, Global Business Network. Uh, I met him initially when he was at SRI, Stafford Research Institute, who pointed out the similarities between missile displays one would find at NORAD and this new thing at the Stanford Coffee House called Pong. Uh, I, I think it was Pong, it might have been Astro. It was the first arcade video game, he said. And, and uh, you, sort of a parallel of your two characters. So uh, I, I, I became part of GBN, and this is one of the ways that I, over the years, have interacted in the world of computer security and national security through, through Peter and meeting people through him. Um, for Minority Report, we actually put together a two or three day a uh, little symposium helped by Global Business Network with extraordinary people. I think Doug Copeland might have been there, and I think that, um, oh my God, Long Hair, who wrote the book about being a Luddite, but he's anything but a Luddite, who created, uh, worked for Disney. I'll remember his name. <laughs> uh, Jared. Thank you. Anyway. Um, Thank you. It's so. So what we were able to do is we had the story worked out, and we were able to just walk through the story and sort of populate the moments with what was just around the corner in terms of technology. Um, so the fact that you are seeing Tom Cruise move information on a screen is because it's about a year or two before you know iPhones came out. Yeah. The you know facial recognition or uh, through eye scanning and tailoring, advertising to the individual, all of that sort of came out because we were able to cast a very wide and a very accurate net. Again, we were lucky because the technology wasn't driving it. Mm -hmm. What was driving it was the story. Um, and you know, it's an, an interesting irony here with the Cruise character who has lost a child who believes had there been pre-crime at that time, he wouldn't have lost the child, which, allowed, which blinds him to the corruption of pre-crime. Okay, that's a very good st story. We can go with that. And only when you have that strong foundation can you then expand it with you know, technological uh, complications or complexities. Mm -hmm. So predictive policing, self-driving cars, biometric targeted advertising. You covered a lot of bases. You could have had footnotes in your movie, but it's a movie. But yeah. Peter, for, for Ghost Fleet, you actually have footnotes in your techno thriller. Talk about that and talk about the research you did for, for a depiction of a war, future war between US and China. Sure, I wanted to hit the one thing, um, actually in a different book that had a nonfiction book, Wired for War, it um, explored the impact of science fiction on the real world and used your example from Minority Report of that, where it may, you may have been drawing from real world technology but by putting it on the screen, it actually was the first exposure that a Pentagon official mm. saw of that real world technology, thinking that it was science fiction, and that, uh, that official said, we need that, <laughs> and then went out and paid for the project that allowed it to pull in. So there's this sort of constant back and forth between the world of science fiction and policy, and it's not just in terms of the design inspiration. Sometimes it can be actually in the budgeting of it. Um, so for Ghost Fleet, it, it's, it's something different. It's a techno thriller, but as you know, with 400 footnotes, and the idea of that was to prove the reality of the seeming science fiction in it. So the rule was every single technology in it, every single geopolitical trend, even some of the quotes that the characters say are all pulled from the real world. And we did that um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one was to um, situate it in reality, to sort of prove this is real. Uh, second, to uh, create this package of um, what you could call useful fiction. So it would be fun and entertaining, but people would find it you know, useful to their world. And I think we've seen that to be the case. And third, um, it allowed, it sort of inoculated us against uh, anyone saying we were revealing classified information. Uh -huh. And um, I had this wonderful experience a, a couple weeks ago where I was briefing, uh, in a brief, briefing a novel, briefing the real world lessons of the novel to a um, group of uh, members of Congress. And one of them, you know, their first question was, how did you get this cleared? You know, basically, how did you get it past security clearance? And I was like, no, I, I work at New America, and here's all the footnotes to it. Or another example was um, 
There's a scene in the book that uh, reveals how a US um, intelligence building could be hacked and actually briefed that in the building and then was able to point to the footnotes as a way of saying, you know, it's already out there in the real world how to do this. I'm not the one creating it. You know, the bad guys are going to be able, they're going to be using this anyway. The knowledge mm -hmm. is there. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned budget, and it makes me think that NASA is having a good year with its budget in part because of the Martian. Um, your mention of uh, interfaces uh, coming, coming from a Minority Report, I highly recommend a book if you're interested called Make It So, which is all about the cross-pollinization of interface design in movies and TV and real interface design. But sometimes the impacts are <coughs> much more directly policy-oriented. For example, War Games in a very real way was a direct inspiration for the maligned by many, including myself, uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986, our primary hacking law. Um, what, is, what does that make you think you know, or feel? Like, do you feel responsible for that? Why do you think a fictional story about a, uh, a hacker in the suburbs could lead to that kind of reaction in Washington, DC? How does that happen? Well, I, I, first question, I don't feel responsible for that. <laughs> and, um, I think that's an appropriate response. Uh, and, uh, and again, since sometimes I thought that we probably may, maybe did a bit too much in terms of romanticizing the hacker, I think it's fine that there was some instigation on either side. I, you know, looking back, it's not that surprising, and it's even relevant to some of the conversations that have been going on here today. Um, the cyber world is a very abstract thing, and cybersecurity is a real, really abstract thing. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share sort of an analogy. I recently uh, we made a movie about M Malala, the Pakistani schoolgirl. And in part of the movie, I, I had a conversation with uh, Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of England, who talked about education as a very difficult topic to get people urgently involved in. Because unlike other global catastrophes, you don't immediately see the problem. In other words, if a tsunami hits, if there are refugees, if there is a, a, a drought, there are actually photographs at the moment, and hopefully you can win the hearts and minds of the public and of NGOs and of governments to do something about it, but you don't see a lack of an education for 15 years. And it, it, so one of the things we try to do with a movie like Malala is to take something which is important and make it seem urgent. Well, in the same way, in retrospect, the fact that you can see a story that says, oh, a kid used a telephone to hack into a computer system thinking he wanted to play a game and brought us to DEF CON 5. The fact that I can say that sentence tells you something. It's a vivid sentence. It, 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 it reflects what stories are. It's about a character doing something you know, that has uh, consequences. So the fact that it took that story to add urgency to something which is by its nature rather abstract. I mean, we can visualize what warfare looks like. We can have met, we've seen photographs of what, you know, an atom bomb's devastation is. We learn about terrorism. We can see the effects. It's very hard to grasp the actual effects and the actual ac actions of, of, of the hacker and the destruction that is caused by it. So I don't think that it is all that surprising that in particular in, the, in, in this field, a, a responsible narrative becomes part of the package of getting something done. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm actually seeing quite a bit, just in the past year, of science fiction in particular being used as a policy tool, as a way to educate or explain something. Um, you know, Peter, your co-author of Ghost Fleet, August Cole, he has a project at the Atlantic Council all about exploring the future of warfare through science fiction. I've seen uh, uh, the Think Tank Data and Society Commission science fiction for its conferences. Uh, Amy Stepanovich, who was here earlier, uh, her organization, Access Now, their Crypto Summit, had a flash fiction contest about the future of encryption. And I was reading just, just last week or the week before, the White House had a workshop with science fiction writers to talk about the future of humanity in space. Um, why do you think this is happening? Is this a new development? Uh, you know, how do, how, do we, how do we view the role of science fiction as a, as a policy tool or, or uh, 
way of reaching different constituents? I don't know if it's, if, if it's a new development. There's been a long history of an interaction between science fiction and the world of policy. Uh, so, you know, arguably the, there was a wave of uh, sci-fi prior to World War I, um, basically warning of the dangers of mechanized war, warning of a rising Germany, what it would mean for Great Britain. Um, actually, one of the you know, examples of this would be Arthur Conan Doyle's story, Danger, that you know, warned that submarines were going to be a game changer for war, and they would present uh, also some you know, new sort of legal ethical questions. Um, there's a history of that. Uh, science fiction also has the power, as you were putting it, you know, I would describe it not just to be predictive or warning, but to be emotive, it causes an emotional response. I think we're seeing that right now, for example, within the um, killer robotics debate, which is a debate about artificial intelligence, autonomy, complex topics, but that link to the Terminator is really what's provoking the action to it. Um, another thing science fiction can do is just, frankly, distribution. I mean, I've experienced this. Uh, senior leaders, powerful people, are more likely to read a novel than they are a edited volume. Um, it just is uh, what it is for those of us in think tank land. Um, but I, the one thing, and this is where you know, I'm sure you're gonna agree with, it can't just be I'm gonna throw science fiction at the problem. So I was told by someone, you know, based on the, ghost, the success of Ghost Fleet, they said, we're gonna do a ghost fleet for healthcare policy. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, no. Can't wait to read it. Yeah, well, that was, it was like, no, you have to start with the things that create you know, a story, a good story. What are your characters? What are your plots? So you know, we had a story we wanted to tell. The message was layered kind of not on top of it, but within it. We had the characters that you know, we found connection to. So you can't just sort of throw uh, science fiction, either writers at it or say, hey, policy wonk, you're now a fiction writer. I mean, you got to start with the story. The fiction has to be good. And in turn, if you want it to have effect, it has to be grounded in reality. It can't be, you know, pure fantasy. Hearing that, it, I, it, it made me think about something I haven't thought about for a little while. Uh, War Games was in the 80s. And there were three movies of that decade that dealt very differently with the same problem, which is, by the way, a topic which is as old as science fiction, which is humankind losing control of a mechanized world. I mean, it's, it's, it, but the ones I'm talking about are RoboCop, um, uh, Terminator, and War Games. It's, what's interesting is RoboCop, it's like, well, the man-machine is sort of out of control, and first is a disruptor of uh, a, a corrupt system, and finally comes into kind of the realm of the human. Terminator's totally about us losing to the machines. And you were asking what stuck about Matthew Broderick and War Games. It's the one that sort of said, even on a deeper level, forgetting hacking, forgetting the specifics of any of that, is that this kid was capable of controlling his cybernetic destiny. He, he didn't lose control. He kept control of it. And I think in that way, there's something empowering about that that is sort of taken hold, as opposed to a sort of a nihilistic story, which is often the case with science fiction and artificial intelligence or any cybernetic system. And there's usually, um, I would arguably argue, there has to be some kind of moral, ethical dilemma within it to be Absolutely. great science fiction. I remember um, actually interviewing, uh, she was very interesting, she was both a NASA roboticist, she led the Mars rover program, but she was also the founder, uh, founding director of the Science Fiction Museum and Hall of Fame, and she said, um, her name is Donna Shirley, and she said, good science fiction doesn't tell you how to build the bomb, <coughs> it tells you if you build the bomb, you might get Dr. Strangelove. And that, I think, you know, when I go to these questions around, you know, your work in cybersecurity, it's not just the, the what ifs of what we might get it, it's the warning of the dilemmas within it. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question, and then I wanted to open it up to the audience. Uh, so uh, uh, think about what questions you might have uh, for Walter or Peter. Uh, speaking of the responsibility of creators, something that came up earlier uh, in the panel about women in cybersecurity is the traditional depiction of the hacker is sort of of the, you know, hoodied, 
uh, dude, uh, you know, the programmer, uh, 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 to use the terminology from, um, from earlier today. Do you see that changing? What does it take to change that? <coughs> Pardon me. Um, I will give the positive example, I think, of Mr. Robot, which in addition to being the most accurate depiction of hacking I've seen in any medium, uh, has three female technical experts in it, and only one of them is what you'd call the like pixie dream girl hacker. Um, but I'm curious what you guys think Well, look about at that. the girl with the dragon tattoo. It's the ultimate hacker anti you know, and I, I, I see these things as a, the reality of the world catches up with the fiction. You know, I think probably 15 years ago it was a more male world than it is now. And B, it, it has to do with good writing as best to bad writing. In other words, playing into that preconception or to that, that stereotype of, I love that term, programmer, I think it's an easy choice. And if you go out and look at the world, it's probably not accurate. So hopefully people who write these sorts of things will look at the world more accurately. You know, I, you kind of combine things. I think, you know, in the indie film world, you have the, the pixie dream girl. Um, in the hacker world, we've got, you know, goth IT expert girl. I mean, I can't, there's so many different IT, sorry, you know, cybersecurity or police dramas. And there's, you know, the tech expert who's always the goth girl. And that's, um, again, these are, these are, uh, in many ways, um, it feels to me like lazy character building. That's, that's um, and in part, I even think the creators are doing it now because that's the expectation. You know, there's kind of a cookie cutter of what you need in a successful TV show, and you need kind of the you know rugged guy lead and the young guy. You know, you, you've got sort of these five roles, and now there's there's goth IT person. Um, one of the things that that was interesting in the reactions to Ghost Fleet was. Um, uh, not specific to the to the hacker side, but the roles that we had characters when it came to gender. So, for example, one of the main characters is a um, a marine officer that's on the run behind enemy lines, and um, the fact that she's a woman is secondary to the fact that she's a marine. And that comes from you know, and, and there's never any moment, kind of expected lazy moment in it, where someone goes, "I won't follow your orders because you're a woman." No, she's a superior officer who's a Marine, they'll follow her orders. And that's because it reflects kind of what's changing there. Another aspect is um, when it comes to sexual identity. So uh, one of the things that a lot of reviewers commented on was there's a moment where two US Navy officers, both of whom are married, are talking about going on leave, and one of them just in the course of conversation you know, reveals that he's married to another guy. And they move on with it. It's not a, it's not a moment, it's not a thing, because guess what? That's where we either are or are headed to as both a nation and within the military. Um, you know, the culture wars of the 90s are in the 90s. Um, so I think, you know, what you're getting at is this question of uh, how much is your responsibility to reflect what's happening right now? How much of your responsibility is to try and trend spot and kind of move forward? And then how much of your responsibility is to try and um, Try and create change. Are you trying to, you know, idealize certain roles? And I don't have a good answer to that, but I, you know, hopefully you're you're doing some kind of uh, juggling between those three. Well, maybe the audience has a good answer or a good question, which we have time for probably one or maybe two questions. Do we have any questions in the audience or on Twitter, sir? Uh, there will be a microphone shuttled to you uh, momentarily. Uh, this gentleman, right? Up. Oh, okay. Yes. When you see something like CSI Cyber or even Scorpion, do you cringe or do you think it's a way in? Me? I, 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 I hate to say it, I haven't seen them. <laughs> I, I have seen one episode of each of them and uh, I know that both of them have excellent consultants that give them great advice and then are mostly ignored in their depiction of what the world is actually like. Um, again, I, I would actually recommend Mr. Robot. Although, like, it, it sort of falls into the trap of the nihilistic, not socially skilled, angry, anti-establishment hacker trope. But in terms of the 
technical depiction, it's, it's very strong. It, 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 in defense of the people who make those shows, and they're very talented people, I remember several times in the past networks uh, putting out, would, would I be interested, would we want to do a sneakers television show? And the idea of actually doing a, an authentic cybersecurity hacking, some kind of story like that on a weekly basis, given how difficult that movie was to figure out, just seemed impossible. I, I think one of the reasons why something like Mr. Robot could work is that television has changed and that's allowed to be one story told over 10, 10 Rather than a 10 case hours. of the week every, yeah. But the case of the week, that might work very well for, you, you know, forensics and other kinds of procedurals, but I can't imagine how they can do it on, on, on cyber, because it's just too complex. And I'm, I guess, whether they do a good job, I'm not sure. It's that example of the, the cookie cutter of what I was saying. You know, there was a model that, you know, frankly, spun out of original CSI and um, actually JAG. And, you know, and then we get NCIS, and then we get NCIS in cities that don't even have naval bases <laughs> in no. them. Um, but, but that said, what are the, you know, what are the most successful shows on TV right now? There is a reason why the cookie cutter is that model. It's because it's working and it's easy for audiences. And I think that's you know, the appeal of Mr. Robot, um, not just to this field, but also to uh, different kinds of audiences, is it's challenging to them. And uh, that has to be a lot more fun to make as well as uh, it certainly is enjoyable. And you know what I like about it, I like it, but also my mom likes it as well, and she is definitely not a cybersecurity person. Your mom's pretty cool. Um, on that note, uh, we are done here. I wish we could take more questions, but Walter and Peter will both be around, uh, so please uh, say hello. Thank you very much, guys. We really appreciate it.